go ahead, start the question. Out. Well, um, first of all, uh, talk a little bit about uh, yourself and also the uh, the Coastal Research Center and uh, some of its uh, mission. Well, I started here in 1971 after doing graduate work at the University of Massachusetts. And with the uh, advent of the marine science program, my part of it was physical sciences, geology, marine science of a physical nature. That's tides, currents, storms, wind, waves, and sediments that are part of that equation. Um, in uh, 1981, the borough of Avalon asked for some special help and several students and myself went down and we did some work for the Environmental Commission. And then we had Hurricane Gloria in uh, 1985. And the state of New Jersey found itself in need of um, verification of storm damage to various beaches along the Jersey coast. And they really didn't have any pre-storm data. They could have plenty of data after the storm. Oh, we better go out and survey what happened but they had nothing to bounce it off of uh, pre-storm. So uh, then Senator Bill Bradley acquired uh, uh, congressional uh, authorization and funding for New Jersey to do something about its problem of documentation. And one of the things that it did do was set up the New Jersey Beach uh, Profiles Network, which we've been doing since the fall of 1986, twice a year. Uh, with 105 stations surveyed um, for the last 26 years. So we have a very large set of data associated with those stations, plus additional work we've been doing for municipalities, for counties, and for uh, FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers. So that's basically who we work with. And uh, the products are information, data, surveys, maps, information that flows to the decision makers and policy makers. So what's uh, some of what you've seen looking uh, at the Sandy damage and you know what needs to be done in the immediate and uh, long-term future? Well that's three questions all at once. Um, <laughs> we'll try. But uh, well, what have you seen like uh, looking up and down uh, the coast, uh, the shore, you know, uh, for FEMA, like what, what's some of what you've seen and what's some of what, you know, do you, you think will be the most pressing issues in the next, uh, in the immediate future? Well, storm damage is, can be divided into two main parts. One is the tidal surge flooding, which affected every place, uh, increasing towards the north into New York Harbor. Uh, the other has to do with the wave damage associated with the incoming storm and the two tides that it was active uh, on Monday the 29th of October. And so the tidal surge is one aspect where flooding is flooding and unless you were high enough you got flooded. And the storm and wave damage associated with the storm has to do with what kind of barriers were present between the damageable things, homes, streets, roads, boardwalks, businesses, and the, uh, the storm, whether it was seawalls or bulkheads or a combination of dunes and the bulkheads. All of this stuff was part of that equation, and that varied tremendously between Cape and Atlantic County and Ocean and Monmouth County to the north. Uh, what's some of the difference that you see between like Atlantic and Cape and Ocean and Monmouth? Well, it's essentially the intensity of the storm. Uh, the second tide uh, on Monday evening was blunted by the fact the storm came ashore, the winds changed direction, and essentially blew offshore in the latter parts of the storm. I, I saw two hours of total calm where I lived uh, around starting around nine o'clock at, at night. Uh, that was very beneficial to the situation in Cape and Atlantic counties. Wave runups were 14, 13, 14 feet on the dunes, flooding was less, and uh, the duration of damaging waves at the dunes was correspondingly reduced. So uh, 14 and 15 foot high dunes survived, whereas up north they were wiped out before the evening tide was half over and much higher dunes were breached. Now, uh, part of what the governor uh, is trying to push now, and the lieutenant governor pushed it when she toured Down Beach uh, in uh, late November, was uh, more dune construction and uh, you know more mitigation along those lines on the beachfront. Um, do you think can be doable with the, with the looking at the fact that you know 
dune construction has been so controversial over the years because of the, the effect on views? Well, the view is only a problem if you want to stand landward of the dunes and see the ocean. I mean, you know, if you have a 10-foot dune and a 12-foot storm surge, it doesn't do much more than a speed bump when I was in a parking lot to stop a fleeing bank robber. So um, consequences of that are pretty obvious. Yes, you block the view and have the storm protection. Um, dune heights to stop a sandy type event that hit Monmouth County and Northern Ocean County are going to be double the height of the existing dunes in say Atlantic City. Uh, the other aspect of this that has not been discussed is the width of the beach that sits between the dune and the breaking waves because the first break of the waves, if it's on the dune, rapidly accelerates the rate of dune erosion. Uh, we saw rates of erosion of 12 feet an hour uh, with a 10 hour storm. That means you have to have a 120 foot thick dune, which is wider than the beach and dune system entirely in most cases where the damage was high. Now looking at uh, rebuild versus retreat, uh, that's been talked about a lot, like whether Barrier islands are essentially um, a natural, naturally shifting thing that you know man should never have you know been building you know permanent structures on in the first place. Like, what do you think is the long-term vision for barrier islands? Well, uh, geologically, well, we're doomed. Uh, sea levels rising, and if it continues to rise at its present rate, we're out of here by 2,500. Um, that said, none of us are going to be here. So do we want to keep the house and keep the lot and keep living there for the rest of our 30 or 40 years on the, on the planet Earth? I'd say we're going to go for it. Now, um, where this development followed the knowledge that's gained in the last 40 years about barrier islands and beach behavior, Kiowa Island in uh, South Carolina comes to mind. There they restricted development to a thousand feet from the dunes. They put a golf course between the dunes and the first house. You can play golf out there. In fact, you can play golf on sand if you really want to, if it is totally overwashed. So the houses are well back from any potential storm damage other than the tidal flooding. That you deal with by raising stuff up to an elevation that doesn't get flooded. Um, in New Jersey, construction started in the 1880s, 1870s, after the Civil War, and in some cases even before that, in Cape May City and uh, Long Branch, pre-war construction was ongoing. So by uh, 2012, everything that's been built has been built already, and you either have to abandon it, clear it, and turn it into beaches and sand, or you have to build better, stronger, and smarter when you replace stuff. And uh, you, you mentioned um, what's going to be happening uh, with future loss due to climate change. Um, uh, what do you think can be done at this point uh, to try to mitigate that? Can anything still be done, or has, have we gone beyond like the point of no return with that? Well, climate change is an inertia. It got started in the 1850s with the um, Industrial Revolution, um, yes, we're still burning coal like crazy. We're still using lots of fuel of all sorts and types, and we have uh, more cows on the planet than we have people. And they essentially burn a lot of methane and, and emit it, as do we. So the long story short is the greenhouse gases are increasing and unless we can sequester or remove greenhouse gases at way faster rates than we are now, uh, there's going to be more rise before it peaks, levels off, or begins declining. Unless something happens in terms of the solar radiation constant, which has changed in geologic time, uh, we are in trouble because, you know, 600 million years ago, the Earth was entirely covered in snow, and it damn near extinguished life on the planet, and then things warmed up again. So that was the big freeze that basically only geologists are even cognizant of, let alone politicians. They, they don't know anything about the snowball days. South Carolina. Um, what areas in this uh in South Jersey, um, are you most concerned about if there was a, a storm surge and a, uh, 
a hit from a hurricane of the type that uh, hit Ocean and Monmouth County? Well, the, to this day, we're still looking at Northern Ocean County and uh, Monmouth County, but mostly Northern Ocean County and Long Beach Island as being the most vulnerable spots because there's so much work that needs to be done to have a wider shoreline between the development and low tide, high tide, low tide, that sort of, the, essentially the intertidal zone. Um, in many cases, after uh, Hurricane Irene, it was less than 20 feet from the cut in the dunes to the house. Well, that meant when you had something four or five times as powerful as Irene, it just went right through the house. Underneath it, if it was on pilings, the house is still there. It's just a little hard to get to. And uh, that amount of material has to be returned. And then the Army Corps design for Long Beach Island needs to be extended the length of the barrier or also in Northern Ocean County. Now, that's a 250 foot wide dry beach, a 22 foot high dune, which is about 100 feet wide at its base. That will give you a great measure of storm protection because in Brant Beach, half of that dune is still standing. How barrier islands change over time. Talk a bit about Brigantine and its north versus south and how, it, how it's changed over time. Well, humans have been involved in that story. Um, mostly a natural barrier when a sandy type event happens, sand from the, sh the beach side washes onto the island and is deposited into the lagoon or bay or marshes landward of the island. So the island moves effectively landward and upward in time as sea level rises. In fact, you have to remember this whole story started 25,000 years ago with a 400 foot lower sea level and 70 mile drive across the coastal plain and continental shelf to the beach of that era. So it's been going on for thousands, 25,000 years. Now, um, what do you do with the rest of the situation in terms of uh, how you focus attention on this? Basically, you've got one story and one story alone. If you want to stay in place, you have to elevate, reinforce, and do what you can until you have to give it up because it's just too, uh, too much water and too much coming in at you. I mean, the Dutch are trying to fight off inundation with a huge estuary and harbor closing gate that cost them billions to build. That's being suggested for New York Harbor. Um, it's going to be billions to recreate that here. Does that buy you time? Yes. Will it solve a 20 foot sea level rise crisis? No, it can't possibly. So there, in, you know, we're talking human life versus geologic time, and the two are not necessarily compatible. Yes, humans will be here after that much time goes by, but they'll be in a different place. And uh, what about uh, development in the, the wetland areas? Uh, Tidal flooding. If you're living at six foot elevation, you either got, you got two choices. Endure the flooding over and over again, or jack up the house and live at a higher elevation because the lot will still be there, but the uh, water will be coming more and more frequently. And we're talking about a foot plus per century. In a lifetime, big deal. But in four lifetimes, there you go. You're a foot and a half more water. And in lots of cases, that would put water in streets that I know happens today on spring tides in Metner, Margate, the back bays of Long Beach Island and Ocean City. You get a 6.2, 6.3 foot tide and suddenly you've got four inches of water in the street. And that could happen every high tide if the sea level keeps rising. What do you think about the fact that you know, so many people simply do not believe in climate change and simply don't think it exists and don't don't worry about it. Well, I clearly haven't spent much time with uh, the history of the planet. Um, and that's easily understood that that doesn't happen. I mean, you know, there are people that don't believe that uh, man went to the moon. They think it's a Hollywood skit that was put on for government conspiracy purposes. So climate change is real. Climate change is happening. And in the last 200 years, it's accelerated. 
make of it what you will and worry about it if you care to, but it is going to change where we get our food, how we live our lives along the shore, and ultimately our great, great, great grandchildren are going to have to have made some accommodations for it. And um, moving along to uh, the wildlife uh, in the area that you study, you've uh, done, the Coastal Research Center has done uh, studies involving uh, terrapins, uh, that and what you've learned. Well, the terrapin study was to essentially quantify and map uh, for the Wetlands Institute uh, all of their voluminous data on uh, where terrapins uh, end up getting killed by vehicles on the access points to the barrier islands mostly. And so what we did for them was turn that into mappable documents that could be presented and some of the ideas that came out of that I saw used this uh, past year with uh, a better and more elaborate anti-terrapin fence. Basically it was uh, eight inch diameter black flexible piping that is just laid alongside the highway. Um, and terrapins can't climb over it and vehicles run over it with ease if they go off the road. So it's not like something solid to run into and it keeps the terrapins from getting squashed on the highway because the females lay their eggs and they want to climb up stuff and they'll climb up a, 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 a you know a, a, do it in a golf course they'll do it in a grab they, they lay and we have a shell uh, driveway and here at the college and they lay eggs in the shells so they're not terribly discriminatory where they will lay their eggs so that's what that job was for as far as the uh, work with the uh, salt marshes are concerned. That was uh, dealing with uh, your salt marsh bluff and bank erosion um, and other things similar uh, along those lines. And there's also the what they call the living shorelines uh, objective where you use grasses, marsh material, other sorts of living entities, oyster reefs and things like that to help buffer the lagoon and bayside shores from boat wake erosion and storm damage that occurs there too. I don't know where that came from. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think the natural flows there